Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, FirstNet Medical Emergencies and HIPAA Compliant Data Sharing. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Danny Ramey. I'm the editor of Mission Critical Communications, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. FirstNet, built with AT&T, is the webinar sponsor. We have some excellent information and several expert presenters scheduled for you today. We'll include time at the end of the webinar for questions from attendees and do our best to wrap up the webinar in an hour to be courteous of everyone's time. Our first presenter is Kurt Bashford, CEO and protagonist of Responsive Innovation at General Devices. His experience at GD spans 35 years and includes developing and marketing communications and telemedicine solutions for EMS, hospitals, and healthcare providers. He has overseen hundreds of project, projects for organizations such as the New York City Fire Department, the Los Angeles County Fire Department, and major hospital systems across the country, and has been involved in FirstNet projects since its inception. Kurt is a board member of the Nipstick Foundation and the Career Advisory Board at NJIT, a member of NAEMSP and the Entrepreneurs Organization. He holds a BSEE and MS in Biomedical Engineering from New Jersey Institute of Technology and is a former EMT. He has also actively engaged in national panels and presentations sharing his experience. Our next presenter is Aaron Markt, Senior EMS and Pre-Hospital Coordinator at the Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts. As a paramedic, she has 16 years of experience working in a fast-paced urban EMS system where in addition to practicing as a field training inter-facility paramedic, she concentrated on quality improvement. Erin is heavily involved in the county, regional, and state level committees in Massachusetts. In addition to her passion for teaching, Erin is a huge advocate for crisis intervention and peer support as well as disaster response. She is certified advanced emergency medical dispatcher, ICS 400 certified, and an AHA, ACS, NAEMT, DHS instructor for multiple disciplines. Her greatest passion has been teaching and mentoring paramedic students specializing in cardiac arrest and post-arrest management and treatment. Our third presenter is Kimberly D'Angelo, clinical education specialist at AMR Western Massachusetts. Kim has 16 years of experience working in a fast-paced urban EMS system with 911 and transfer services. After four years of working overnight shifts, Kim accepted a job offer to work in the quality improvement department in Springfield, Massachusetts. She was promoted to clinical education specialist in 2019, where she oversees the quality and education department for 400 EMS employees. Over the last year, Kim has spearheaded a COVID tax task force in Springfield, Massachusetts for testing and vaccination efforts. In her free time, she enjoys spending time with her family. Our final presenter is Dylan Formoyle, Vice President at Carada. Dylan has 20 years experience in the wireless industry, initially working for Dill and Vodafone in Europe before building mobile networking and cybersecurity businesses, which have connected and secured thousands of businesses across the globe. Dylan and his team at Carada are passionate about protecting every organization, no matter how big or small, against the growing security risks they face every day. Before we begin, I want to briefly explain a few of the user features of our webinar service. You will see the attendee control panel in the upper right-hand side of your screen. The control panel can be expanded or collapsed by clicking the icons on the left side of each pane. To the left is the go-to webinar viewer through which you see the presentation. To the right is the control panel where you can ask questions and select your audio mode. The default audio mode is mic and speaker through your computer, but you can also click the telephone button and dial in using the number you received in your email. All attendees are muted to reduce background noise. If you'd like to submit a question for one of the presenters or myself, use the questions pane. Just type in your question and click send to submit your question. We'll reserve time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. AT&T has made a PDF of the slide presentation available. You'll see a handouts pane in your control panel. Click the name of the handout to access it. Your default web browser will automatically launch and open a blank page in the handout file will start downloading to your designated downloads location. You can then click the downloaded file to open or save it. Finally, a recording of the webinar will be emailed to all registrants and be available at www.mccmag.com. In addition, a certificate of attendance will be emailed to all attendees about 24 hours after the webinar. With that, we'll get started. Thank you again for joining us. First, an overview of FirstNet. FirstNet provides public safety professionals with a library of pre-evaluated mobile tools in the FirstNet app catalog. The catalog only includes approved apps that FirstNet has vetted, tested, and confirmed are relevant, highly secure, and reliable. This webinar and our future app, FirstNet app webinars feature a small number of the more than 
160 apps that first responders and their supporting agencies are already depending on to address emergent needs. Through this webinar series, we are excited to highlight um, agency app stories that illustrate how FirstNet and FirstNet approved apps are reliably connecting people, places, and things through voice, data, and video in the field. You can find out more about FirstNet and FirstNet apps at firstnet.com. And feel free to submit any questions or requests for follow-up um, during the webinar. And now Kurt will, Kurt will take over to talk about general devices. Thank you, Dan. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, that looks great. <clears throat> okay, let me just tab over to that so I can see it. Okay. So uh, as you said, I'm Kirk Bashford. I'm the CEO and purveyor of dad jokes here at General Devices, or GD as we go by. Uh, I'd like to thank the folks at Mission Critical and FirstNet for inviting us to share our experiences in managing COVID-19 with our FirstNet verified eBridge mobile telehealth and telemedicine app. And, and thanks also to the attendees for their time today. So GD is a 40 plus year old med tech company based in New Jersey. We've been focused on EMS to hospital communication since 1990, well before we called it by names of telehealth and telemedicine. So our core purpose is to improve the health and well-being of the public at large by providing what we call responsive innovation that connects first responders and healthcare providers. This core purpose drives and defines who we are as a company and what we do with our technology solutions. So it was of course a natural fit for GD back in late January of last year, 2020, uh, before we even knew this was gonna be a, a global pandemic. We created a COVID-19 screening form and distributed that to all our customers at no charge. Little did we know that was just the beginning of this new paradigm in which we live today. So I'm, I'm very pleased to have two very innovative customer partners with us today, uh, Aaron Mark in, from Bay State and Kim D'Angelo from AMR. They're gonna show you their boots on the ground, frontline healthcare experiences on using GD's eBridge on FirstNet to manage COVID-19 in the Western Massachusetts area. A little quick background before they begin their presentations. Uh, GD offers several product solutions, eBridge, is the focus of uh, this presentation. And it's the leading, industry leading FirstNet verified mobile telemedicine telehealth app that enables live HIPAA secure communications, video and data among EMS and hospital teams. EMS, uh, sorry, eBridge is an easy to use and fully configurable to enable simply smarter care in the right care at the right time in the right place with a goal of course to save lives improve outcomes and reduce costs our contact can be up at the end if you if you're interested in learning more at this time i'm very pleased to introduce aaron and kim to share their experience in managing covid 19. Kurt, thank you for the introduction. My name is Erin Markt, and I'm the Senior EMS and Pre-Hospital Coordinator for Bay State Medical System, um, or Bay State, Bay State Medical Center in Springfield. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the uh, New England area, sorry, Danny, next slide. Um, Bay State Health is comprised of five hospitals in Western Massachusetts. Bay State Medical Center is our main campus located in Springfield, Mass, and serves the community as the only PCI capable and level one trauma center in Western Mass. We have 716, 90 of which um, of these beds are in our emergency department and we see over 110,000 patients a year. We receive on average 120 ambulances per day and our cath lab is available 24 seven for emergent PCI procedures. However, weekends and evenings are our off hours. Bay State Medical Center is the only pediatric emergency department in West, uh, Western Massachusetts and we are a primary stroke center with neuroendovascular treatment capabilities. In addition, uh, we're also a designated SANE site, a birthing center, and we hold affiliations with LifeStar for air medical transport and dispatch health for mobile integrated healthcare. Next slide. 
Uh, in 2017, Bay State Health invested in the future of EMS by hiring a robust EMS team known as the Division of Pre-Hospital and Disaster Medicine. The team is comprised of three EMS and emergency medical uh, or emergency medicine fellowship trained physicians. We have one senior manager who has oversight of the EMS coordinator team, our critical care transport team, AHA, and all of mobile care. Uh, my current position is a senior EMS coordinator, and I have oversight of the EMS coordinators and I'm in, uh, the primary contact for Bay State Medical Center. In addition, we have four other EMS coordinators who primarily focus on quality assurance, quality improvement, EMS education, and they act as a liaison at our community hospitals. Bay State Health has contracted with American Medical Response of Springfield for interfacility transports, meaning AMR will transport our Bay State Health patients throughout our health system. AMR is also our largest 911 partner, completing an average of 66,000 calls annually. AMR is 60% of our Bay State Medical Center emergency department volume. In the photo, you'll see Dr. Amir Lotfi, our medical director for our STEMI program, and Alina Capatini, Alina Capatina, our STEMI coordinator, who I believe is uh, viewing the webinar today, um, presenting awards to our contracted partner for their continued collaboration with the eBridge program. Next slide. Um, so eBridge is a free to EMS HIPAA secure application that allows EMS to transmit detailed patient information from any location where there is cell phone and Wi-Fi coverage. This range is much broader than radio coverage and allows the transmission of EKGs, patient demographics, and real-time GPS-enabled estimated time of arrival that constantly updates. It allows for real-time communication and to loop in all members of the care team simultaneously so updates are received instantly. We initially invested in four modules, which were the STEMI, general medical, stroke, and trauma, and we later identified the need to add cardiac arrest to assist with neuroprognostication and COVID-19 module during the pandemic. Uh, we have a short video for you guys um, that we made at Bay State Medical Center with one of our affiliated EMS agencies to show you about um, eBridge.
okay, so why did we need uh, eBridge at Bay State Medical Center? Um, prior to eBridge implementation, we had only one way to contact the hospital, which was uh, via recorded CMED radio. And you'll see in the image, oh, sorry, Danny, next screen. Okay, so you'll see in the image um, that the radio coverage area was quite limited. EMS was unable to reach the radio towers until they were about five to 10 minutes away from the campus. Um, this oftentimes did not allow for enough time to mobilize the cath lab off hours. So the semi patients were uh, holding in the ED, unfortunately. Our EMS semi transmission rates uh, via LifeNet uh, pre eBridge were only about 19%. Many agencies found uh, LifeNet to be cost prohibitive with a small yield. It could send an EKG, however, patient demographics were not included. Um, and so searching old EKGs on borderline STEMIs was just not possible. Um, with eBridge, we are now up to 82% compliance with EMS transmission rates. Because EMS was unable to send in the ECGs, that meant that the cath lab was not being activated until they arrived to the ED, further increasing the first medical contact to balloon and door to balloon times. Once the patient was in the ED, the physician would then need to call on-call cardiology for a consult, send ECG pictures uh, via secure core text application and activate the cath lab. Multiple phone calls were happening simultaneously, creating confusion and duplicate work. We knew we needed a better process and began looking into pre-hospital applications that would allow for real-time communication and sharing of PHI securely. We landed on eBridge because they were the most customizable to our unique geographic area and facility. Utilizing eBridge, uh, EMS can send a STEMI alert while still inside the patient home. We're able to view the ECG and activate cath lab before EMS leaves the scene, thus decreasing first medical contact to balloon and door to balloon times dramatically. This is especially important during the cath lab off hours. It's now completely reasonable to have the cath lab ready before EMS arrives and a cardiologist waiting in the ambulance bay. Similarly, the application allows for our stroke and trauma teams to mobilize, to mobilize with more notification than we were receiving with radio. Next slide. We started the eBridge rollout with a few small high-performing agencies so as not to become overwhelmed with the sheer volume. Over the course of a few weeks, we added on one large agency at a time and were able to adjust settings and handle most issues real time. In order to gain buy-in from our local EMS agencies, our EMS and STEMI teams offered to come out and perform the training. We made an educational packet that we've kept updated with any changes as well. We have a strong EMS following on our social media outlets and we are able to utilize that avenue for updates to the program. We would drop in at agencies and visit the ED frequently just to ask how eBridge was working and if the crews had any issues. Um, and we highlighted the wins big time. Uh, we snapped pictures and wrote small stories about some of the excellent first medical contact to balloon times. We included EMS in these stories and we blasted out new record setting times on social media with over 5,000 people reached. Um, our STEMI coordinator also made it into a friendly competition. She drafted a leaderboard um, that we posted in the EMS break room. She updated it regularly with new times and at the end of the year, the top three agencies received excellence awards for their part in treating our STEMI patients. If you're thinking about EMS-based application or eBridge, be sure to have a strong team to highlight the victories and a dedicated physician champion to drive the internal process. To date, we have about 85% of all EMS uh, agencies on board with eBridge. And I'll make note that even some of our cardiologists who were resistant to change initially and still used flip phones after seeing the improvement in times and patient outcomes, uh, they even went out and purchased smartphones to be able to utilize eBridge. Next slide. So does eBridge actually work to decrease first medical contact to balloon times? The answer is yes, it does. So we're gonna show you uh, a little bit of our data. The first cohort of data on the left-hand side is from pre-eBridge implementation. The number of STEMI patients we had was 223 from April 2017 to May 2019. The average first medical contact to balloon time was 94 minutes and our goal was 90 minutes. During this time, EMS was only calling in STEMI alerts via radio and only some of our agencies were transmitting using LifeNet. Even if they did utilize LifeNet, they still had to follow up with a radio call to the online medical control physician to activate cath lab. Post eBridge, with only four months of data to review, we had 43 STEMI patients, and you'll note an immediate reduction in all times. We further broke down the data after eBridge implementation to compare first medical contact to balloon and door to balloon times with use of the radio and then with use of eBridge. The third cohort is radio only, the last is eBridge only. Utilizing eBridge only, we were able to decrease the first medical contact to balloon times by an average of 10 minutes and decrease door to balloon times by an average of 12 minutes. 
This is undoubtedly due to the enhanced real-time communication for all members of the care team that eBridge allows. There was no other process changes during this time period. Next slide. In fall 2019, uh, we entered into the Bay State Health President's Award nomination process with the previously mentioned data to show the improvement. There are four awards, quality, safety, value, and patient experience. We specifically requested to be considered for the quality award. The quality award is assigned to an innovative project that has direct improvement in patient care outcomes. The judging panel consists of our Bay State Health senior leadership to include the chief medical officer, chief nursing officer, uh, chief operating officer, and leadership for most departments to include healthcare quality, finance, patient relations, and security. Our team was awarded the quality award for decreasing first medical contact to balloon times with use of the general devices eBridge application. Next slide. On the left side, you'll see the administrative screen for Bay State Health. These are the current modules, uh, but also our upcoming modules. The test case is incredibly efficient and allows us to train all users without disrupting the emergency department workflow. On the right is a sample of what EMS in Western Massachusetts sees. Our neighboring hospital, Mercy Medical Center, after seeing how successful eBridge was at Bay State, also opted to invest in three separate modules. In August 2019, we introduced the general medical module. Within the first hours of opening this module, we knew we had a problem with our contracted EMS partner, AMR. The AMR devices were not working appropriately and were losing Wi-Fi while attempting to send a case through eBridge. AMR was arriving to our emergency department with critical patients without pre-notification. This delayed patient care and created some chaos. I arrived to the ED on one of my days off and we called our eBridge representative immediately to shut down the general medical for AMR. We were able to determine that the previously used devices were insufficient to support the eBridge application, and we knew that we couldn't let that be the end-all be-all. Um, we worked collaboratively with AMR to find a suitable solution and ensure that AMR could utilize eBridge. I'm now going to turn over the presentation to my colleague, Kimberly D'Angelo from American Medical Response, so she can discuss how the implementation of FirstNet allowed AMR, AMR and eBridge to work flawlessly together. Thank you, Erin. And thank you, Danny, for having me today. And you can go ahead to the next slide. So like Aaron said, we originally had cell phone devices that we were using that worked off of Wi-Fi that we have in our ambulances. Uh, the Wi-Fi is typically used for uh, EPCRs documentation after calls. And that was really our main focus of it when we first implemented it into the trucks. Uh, when we first started using these devices and using eBridge, it was just for STEMIs and it was a lot fewer and far between. Uh, when we branched out to trying the general med option, like Aaron said, we ran into a lot of issues. We found that with connecting to Wi-Fi, we were dropping service a lot. The crews had to wait until they were back out to the ambulance in order to transmit a call through to notify the hospital, which wasn't as integral with general med, but especially with STEMI transmissions and looking to notify the patient's side, it definitely slowed things down. So due to the unreliable technology with the original hardware that we had, we found it necessary to not only change our uh, hardware our devices, as well as find a different network service. Uh, we purchased one Sonom XP8 device per ambulance. Um, every level of ambulance, BLS, ALS, and Chairvan all have their own individual device. Um, we not only were able to use eBridge for notifying the hospitals, we also use it for direct communication between crews, communication to dispatch um, and management if needed, as well as the communication center is able to track using GPS um, to use as an emergency backup safety. You can go ahead to the next slide. So we rely pretty heavily on the applications ES chat and um, eBridge. ES chat is how we dispatch our calls to our crews. Um, they have a pretty, the Sonom devices have an expanded capacity that give us a lot more freedom as to which applications we can put on there to make it pretty well-rounded and easier to justify their use if we can use them for multiple different avenues. Um, we use Zipit, which integrates with the CAD, our computer-aided dispatch device, um, to give real-time call updates to the crews. And now that they're based off the FirstNet uh, cell phone wireless network, uh, we are able to contact the crews when they're in homes, in elevators, and apartment buildings. So a lot of dead spots that we were experiencing in the past with using radios has been alleviated at this point. Uh, we also use ES Chat for intercrew communications. They're able to speak as a group 
by selecting multiple different units on the list, or they can speak one-on-one -on -one if they were going to an intercept, which is really great uh, for an MCI or large agency responses. Uh, next slide. So why did we need FirstNet? We needed FirstNet because the Wi-Fi was just not reliable anymore. Um, we had to wait until we were out to the ambulance to transmit anything, which was the same struggle that we had when we were using the prior system as well. Um, when we tried to use the general med module, like Aaron said, we were dropping Wi-Fi. So it would look like the transmission went through on our end, but the hospital would receive no notification. So within the first couple of hours of training and deploying the new devices on the road, we had to turn them off pretty quickly and figure out a plan B, which is what brought us to FirstNet. Uh, training with these devices was incredibly simple. Uh, we used the job aids that were provided from Base State for using eBridge, as well as on-the-job training to use the Sonam device in general. Uh, we had just-in-time training when the crews reported for their shifts. It was given out by either station supervisors or uh, members of our clinical education team. The applications from eBridge are incredibly user-friendly. Uh, the need for training is incredibly limited, and a quick training is enough to get the job done. Uh, we've had very minimal user complications during the first net and eBridge rollout. The crews greatly appreciated it because they could communicate from the scene, from patient side, rather than needing to return to their vehicles to talk. All right, I'm going to send it back to Aaron. Thanks, Kim. Um, Okay, um, so after we were able to remedy the um, issues with American medical response devices, um, we then entered into a pandemic. So initially, uh, EMS was sending COVID-19 uh, positive patients or persons under investigation, PUI, uh, for COVID-19 through the general medical module. And we quickly realized that this was not sufficient as these patients needed to be separated from the regular population. Um, while PPE was scarce, it was even more important to have enhanced communication with our EMS partners. And so uh, we spoke with our eBridge representative, Jimmy, on a Saturday in early March uh, to say we needed a COVID module as soon as possible. Jimmy had the module up and running uh, within a couple of hours, and it was based off of our general medical module. Next slide. Uh, we have another quick video here for you um, just to show you what our COVID-19 module looks like. After we sent this video out or after we um, uh, posted this on our social media, we also sent out a message to all of our EMS crews that were utilizing eBridge um, to let them know that there was this new module. In our emergency department, um, we also had the uh, COVID cases show up in a different color. So we typically have the red, 
yellow and green for high, low, and medium acuity patients, and we had the um, COVID-19 alerts come up as blue to stand out. Um, this process allowed us to um, implement what we call the EMS ED liaison, and that is a person, either a nurse or a PPE coach or one of the EMS coordinators, um, to be down in the emergency department and to meet um, the EMS crews before entering and then escort them in their PPE um, to their destination within the hospital. Um, currently on the screen, you're looking at a real COVID-19 case from April. Uh, this was a pretty recent one, and um, I want to focus on the, um, the fourth picture there where you'll see the enhanced communication between our emergency department and EMS. Um, our emergency department specifically says, please stay in the ambulance and send one tech in if safe to do so. Um, the full box is uh, what they're asking for there is to send in the driver of the vehicle who is likely no longer in PPE. They will then register the patient, uh, return to their ambulance, don PPE, and then enter uh, with an EMS ED liaison to their destination. Next slide. eBridge also allowed us to implement an interfacility transfer process. So many of our EMS agencies and specifically AMR are transporting patients into our facilities, um, but not necessarily through the emergency department. And so you'll see um, on the, on the um, pictures on the screen right now, the third and fourth um, pictures are the enhanced communication, again, between our critical care transport ambulance and between our uh, transfer center and security. So uh, pretty early on in COVID, we implemented a transfer center, which had one of our EMS coordinators um, kind of managing all of this communication back and forth. And so um, as the crews would get closer to their destination, the transfer center and security uh, would meet them and make sure that they knew exactly where they were going um, so that they were not touching elevators um, and opening doors uh, without that escort. Next slide. So this is a graph from eBridge, which is uh, we pulled off the Describe website, which is where all of the data and old calls are stored. Um, this shows our COVID volume reported through uh, the eBridge alerts from February 2020 uh, through April 2nd, 2021. And you can easily see when the surges in COVID cases occurred, which is consistent with the Mass uh, Department of Public Health data as well. Um, I won't go too far into the Describe website other than to say um, it is a pretty robust system um, that can uh, filter out a lot of the alerts and data. Um, it's been incredibly helpful for the quality assurance and quality improvement processes at Bay State Medical Center. Next slide. So going forward, our plans for general devices, eBridge, um, we've got a lot actually. Um, we'd love to utilize eBridge to its full potential and we're in discussions to add on a few more modules um, that may include OBGYN and that would allow for EMS to speak directly with our birthing center. And we're looking to implement a sepsis module that would allow more accurate tracking and reporting of CMS bundles, including the EMS metrics. Um, there's discussion to expand on our cardiac arrest module to identify ECMO patients early and mobilize the ECMO teams. Uh, eBridge also has a video chat feature uh, that we can utilize for high-risk refusals in the field, direct communication for our critical care transport nurses and paramedics, and to obtain orders from the receiving physician or the medical director. And um, we can use eBridge with our upcoming mobile integrated healthcare programs as well. Because of the demographics in the greater Springfield area, we've also recognized the need to incorporate translation services into these video chats. Um, ideally, working with our INT teams, uh, we could incorporate a way for the eBridge alert to directly feed into our electronic medical record, which is Cerner based. And we're currently in the process of integrating eBridge alerts to send a page automatically to our internal paging system. Uh, Alina has been working incredibly hard on that with Jimmy, and I think we are just about there. Um, also, uh, ideally, we would love to uh, integrate eBridge into all of our community hospitals. Um, the feedback that we've received from EMS has been very positive over the past two years, and we look forward to continue uh, our partnership with General Devices.